Mary had a little lamb. Can you hear me, Internet? Can you hear me, Internet? Well, I can hear myself, so that's good. Uh, hello! Can you hear me, Internet? Oh no, it's oh, just I can hear thing. myself, so that's good. Oh, that's just the light. Uh, delay. hello! Yeah. Alright, howdy! Uh, I'm David, the newest handle lab rat. I think that's how it's pronounced. And today, I'm going to be working on the Celestial Tribunal, and you guys are going to take a look at what that looks like on the inside. Ooh, spooky. So, what we have here is the very beginnings of the first card uh, that we'll be working on, uh, the Celestial Executioner. So basically, uh, we have this format where there's a constructor here, if you know about programming, and we'll put some, we'll put a special string in here. Oh dear, my Xamarin seems to have crashed. That's that's a that's a fortuitous start. Is there something wrong with Twitch? Can you hear me? Alright. So Can you hear me? Let's get started. I gotta turn that off because hearing my own right. voice is extremely distracting. Alright, so we start in this constructor where we put a special string. You might recognize such special strings from cards when you click on them. There's a little box in the top right that tells you important things. Uh, down here we have a function called add triggers, and in here is where we put all the things that the card reacts to, uh, which is the bulk of where everything happens. And then there's another a special function called the play function, which is what happens when you play it. Uh, for this card, the, there isn't any of that. So let's get started. So, it looks like Celestial Executioner at the start of the environment turn. So, let's make a trigger for what happens at the start of the environment turn. So, add trigger uh, start of turn. Is there a start of turn? Add start of turn trigger. There we go. So this is a little helper that'll help us along. We gotta pass it some criteria to know so it knows what turns to start with. So let's say turn taker, which is any turn taker. That could be a villain, a hero, or the environment. But this turn taker, we gotta make sure that it is an environment turn taker is environment. So then we're going to give it a response, so this is what it'll do, and we're going to make our own little function for that. So let's call that uh, start of turn response. Something nice and easy. And then we got to tell the system what type of trigger this is. So at the start of the environment turn, this card deals each target next to a trial three energy damage, so that is a deal damage trigger. Let's go down, and let's make a start of turn response. And so we're going to have to pass it a type of action, because um, all these... There's, sometimes we need data that goes into these functions, like, oh, whose turn is it? Oh, what sort of... Uh, what? A lot of these respond to actions, and we need to have data from those actions, so we're going to pass this a phase change action. Since it's not necessarily relevant here, but that's how the structure of the code works. So then, we are going to 
have it deal damage. Just a second. So, we want... We're going to have a little act, uh, action here that we're going to call E. So, E, deal damage. Yeah, so this is going to deal damage to every target next to a trial, so you got to say the source of the damage is this card, Celestial Executioner. Uh, so then we give it the criteria, so C, we'll call this generic card C. Uh, let me increase my font size. There, that's probably a bit more readable. So we'll, we'll call this card C, and we'll get back to that in a second. So then we're going to give it three energy damage. So three amount, damage type, energy. And that is all the fancy stuff there. So let's get to here, the criteria. So we got to tell it exactly what criteria we want. So C, uh, let's see, each target next to a trial. So C, so, if you look at a card, they have a number of locations. Uh, next to is like where Captain Cosmic's stuff would go, and in this case, there this deck has trials that will go next to cards. So, we're going to look at the next to location. And we are going to get the cards in the next to location. So, we want there to be cards there, first of all. So, we're going to say, okay, we're only going to look at cards that have something in their next two location. So then, and, that's the programming stuff for and. I'm not sure how programming savvy y'all are, but let's see. So, now we want to get the card from the next two location. Well, there could be a number of cards here, so we want to find a card inside. So we want to see that the cards there contain... Well, actually, you know what? We can probably get rid of that greater than uh, the count check, because if it's empty, contains will return nothing. So, let's see. If it contains... Oh, that wants a specific card. Hmm. Hmm, this is a predicament. So let's see. Look at the cards. Another way we can look at this is let's get only the cards which meet a certain condition here. So this little where function. We have the list of cards that it's next to. Let's say that there's a hero card next to a construct or what have you. And a trial. So let's get the cards. So that'll have be the construct and the trial. Where card is trial. Oh, okay, so another step here is trial. So, as you can see here, trial is a keyword that exists. We'll have to add another keyword soon, but not quite yet. So we want to make sure that construct is, or not a construct, the card is a trial. So this will return only the trial if there is one. And we want to make sure that count is greater than zero. Oh, we used C too many times. So let's call this next card, NC. So our condition is only deal damage to cards that in their next two location have a trial, or at least one trial. So then, because of the way we handle the actions in Sentinels, they, we use something called coroutines. We need to use a little bit of uh, extra boilerplate code here. This is code that will appear in many places where uh, the coroutines get handled differently in different scenarios. But basically, what this code here does is it takes this action, this E that we wrote, and it will run it just completely separate. Uh, so, 
So this should work as far as the damage goes. So let's go test that real quick before we move on. So we're going to a test class here. As you can see, this code here creates a new game for testing purposes. So let's go. So the next step is to make a test. And so now we want this to be, hmm, let's look at some other tests for examples. So as you can see, so let's look at the char test in the block. See this? There is a function called test char where we make a new game, we play char, and then we write some test conditions that should check to make sure that everything is happening correctly with the card. So here we're going to do something similar. So we want public void test celestial executioner. And we'll call our new game. Oops. I think we might have put this in the wrong spot. Leave so. Yeah, there we go. Got to put it inside the braces. So we'll call our new game Execute. So we're going to play the card Celestial Executioner. So we're going to need to play a trial as well. And now the trials aren't implemented, but we the cards still exist. So we have them stored in this handy dandy text file, the deck list. So the system knows that the cards exist, and we can still play them, but they won't really do anything. So let's take the trial uh, found wanting. So against found wanting gets played next to a villain target. So it won't get there on its own, so we'll have to move it. So let's see. And we gotta make sure that there's a villain target to play against. So the villain right now is Baron Blade, so let's also play a Blade Battalion. Now we're going to move found wanting or turn taker. Look, turn taker is going to move it. That'll probably be the environment. So we're going to move found wanting to next to the blade battalion. So location blade battalion next to. When we get when we actually get to found wanting, we will. Move, the card will move itself there, so we'll need to get rid of this. But now, if we go to the start of the environment turn, so go to start of environment, we can check to make sure that the Celestial Executioner is doing their damage. So let's do a quick HP storage. So we're going to store the Blade Battalion's HP before and then we're going to check it after. So quick HP check, and we're going to make sure that it has gone down by three. So this is our little test. So we have a big old suite of tests over on the right. Lots and lots. But now we have a Celestial Tribunal one. So let's build this and run it. Something's wrong. Blade Battalion. Did I spell Blade Battalion wrong? One L. So, that was my bad. I apologize. So let's run this test again.
Did I spell it wrong again? Boy, howdy. Two T's, one L. I'm just gonna copy that. That makes sense. Battle is the base word. Alright, so as you can see, our test passed. So we can look at the log here. It's a little dense, but what happens is we play our cards, we advance. The Blade Battalion does some damage, because that's what they do at the end of the villain turn, but we advance from turn to turn to turn to turn to turn to the Celestial Tribunal's turn, where the Celestial Executioner initiates damage to the Blade Battalion. Oh boy, the chat. There is chat, chat going on. It's very small. I can't actually read it on my screen. So forgive me for not being very responsive. But it does what we want now in that regard, so that's good. So let's go back to the Celestial Executioner, because there's more text here. If no targets are dealt damage this way... Here, I'll pop over to here so you can read it as well. If no targets are dealt damage this way, reveal cards from the top of the environment deck until a trial is revealed. Put one into pl put it into play and discard the other revealed cards. So, next step. So now, this is something that triggers in response. So yeah, let's let us comment here exactly what's going on. That's something that slipped in my mind with all this explanation. Uh so this card deals each target next to a trial three energy damage. So that explains what this code does here. The next step, let's bring this bring this into here. So let's start here. If no targets were dealt damage this way, we'll get to the rest in a second. So now we need to check to make sure that damage is dealt this way. So a way that we do that is one of the parameters we can pass in here is stored results. Stored results. So now we want to save the damage that goes on here. So we want to get our stored damage equals. We're going to make a list of deal damage actions. We're going to give it to this deal damage. Stored damage. So now, after it's complete, we can go back and take a look and make sure the damage was actually dealt. So, if stored damage well, let's see. We might have a helper for this. So, did deal damage. We do, in fact, have a helper. I'll step into it. To Alright, it looks like we are back. Sorry about that. Now, where did I leave off? Uh... Alright, we're revealing cards from the top of the environment deck. So, let's look... We have a number of helpers in this regard, so reveal cards, and we want to put cards into play and discard the rest. So, reveal cards, play it, or discard it. Let's look at this. So, this, we can pass it a criteria of what cards to auto-play. And those... So yeah, this looks like it's the one we want. So, let me move this comment up. This will do both of these things in one, because, believe it or not, there are a number of cards. Oh, it looks like tooltips are not appearing, so I apologize for that. But basically, uh, this, this is a helper that will take a criteria for the cards that get revealed, and then allow us to play or discard based on that criteria. 
Now this is only one card, so let, let's let make sure that we can have reveal cards, put some into play, discard remaining. There we go. So now we're going to pass it a location. So we want this dot turn taker, which is the environment, dot deck. We're going to reveal cards from the deck. They want a number of cards to reveal. Uh, if we pass, mm, let's see. Yeah, if we pass a null here, we can pass a different parameter that says reveal until number of matching cards, which is something that's closer that we want, because there's no set number of cards to reveal here. So we'll just pass null for this one, which is number of cards to reveal. Uh, so then card criteria. So this is where we give it the criteria that we want. So we're going to make a little object. This is a handy little object called a link card criteria, which is, holds this, these criteria that we've been using. So we'll come back to that in just a second. And now we want to make sure that it is reveal until number of matching cards. And we want one. So, let's give it some criteria. The criteria is, is trial. Simple enough. So now this code will do what we want. Put Reveal cards, put some into play, and discard the remaining from the environment deck. Make sure it's a trial, and reveal until a trial is put into play. So now we want to give it the boilerplate so that it does this. Indentation is weird, but fixed. Okay. So now we can go back to our little test. Oh, that's not it. Here we are. And now we have to test this. So let's get rid of found wanting. Or destroy card. There are no trials in play, even though that target is still around. So let's go to start of the environment turn again. This will loop us all the way back around, so I think for the purpose of our test it'll be handy to remove villain triggers so that Baron Blade doesn't do anything funky. So we're going back to the start of the environment turn. Ah, I forgot a step. I apologize. In this, we can add a description to the cards so that it, if we need to turn it into a string, so like it's asking you a question about trials or what have you, we want to put in a little string to remind you, the user interface what exactly it is we're looking for. I forgot about that. But back to our test. So we destroy the trial. We go back to the start of the environment, there are no targets to deal damage to, so we want to check our HP again and make sure that it's zero. Zero change. There's actually a function for that. Zero. Zero change. And then we want to make sure that it plays a trial card. So let's go back. After we've destroyed found, let's stack the deck and put that... Um, let's put that a couple cards down, just to make sure. So we're going to stack the deck. But before we get to that, let's pick a few other cards. So there's Found Wanting. We want not a trial, so let's do the Celestial Chamber. Sorry, I have the cards in front of me. So Far Chamber equals Get Card. The Celestial Chamber. And... Let's get card celestial. There's a they use that word a lot in this deck. Adjudicator, which I'm pretty sure I spelled right on the first go, but we shall see. So now we're going to make a list of cards. Of 
cards. And we are going to put these cards in the list. So, deck stack, add. We're going to add found wanting. We're going to add chamber. Sorry. So, still chamber. And we're going to add add the celestial adjudicator. And now, now we're going to take the environment deck and pass it this list to stack it. And note that these are in reverse order because that's how this parses that that data. You want the cards you want on top, you put at the bottom. So now we have the deck stacked. And at the start of the environment turn, we want to check. Those are called asserts. We want to assert in trash, celestial adjudicator. So in the environment trash, that's where an adjudicator should go. In the trash is where the chamber should go. And in play, Assert is in play. We want found wanting. It might not be in the right place because we haven't programmed it, but it'll th it will have played it because it is a trial. So let's run this test. So something is working. So let's take a look. So we go to the start, and nothing happens. So let's see why. Go back to the Celestial Executioner. Oh. Let's add a little debug code to make sure that this is happening and something isn't off the rails. So we're going to add something that will stand out in this log over here in the bottom right. So, I made it here. Something will stand out. So, when we run this, when we get to this code, it should play this no matter whether or not damage is dealt. So yeah, it is. We're making it here. Oh, you know what the trick is? We only want to do this if we didn't deal damage, and so we want to do the opposite of what that was saying before. And that's why nothing happened. So let's try this again. So now, it reveals Adjudicator, Celestial Chamber, and Found Wanting discards the two and puts found wanting into play exactly as it should. So that's a complete card. Well, almost. Let's add a special string to check to see if there are any trials in play and if there are, who has them? Because it could be a little confusing to rifle through all the cards to find who and who doesn't have trials. So we're going to do a special string maker. Special string maker. So show, we can show a lot of things. We want to show a list of cards probably, because we want to know what the cards are. Show a list of cards, and we want to give it a criteria. So this criteria is going to be it's going to be the same criteria as we have down here. So we can actually just copy this. So we want cards that have trials next to them. 
And so here's where that description that was mentioned earlier comes ha comes in handy, because this is what it'll say next to the this list of cards. So we want it to be something descriptive. So. Hmm. What should we call this? So it explicitly says targets next to trials. So let's do targets next to trials. And we can mess with capitalization or what have you later. But we want to make sure that it does not use the card suffix automatically since we're already saying targets. So we have to tell it, no, don't use that. So let's see in our test if we can get that special string to show up. So the first time we move the card into position and assert special string for execute. And it'll be string number zero because cards can have multiples. And so what Let's give it nothing, and let's see what the special string is at this point, because it will print it, and this will fail at this point. Targets next to trials. Blade Battalion. That looks like a decent string to me, so let's keep that. And so now we want to make sure like now this will check to make sure okay this is this special string remains like that th it is always showing that correctly whenever we run this test no matter what changes we make to the code so let's check what happens when there are no cards next to trials we've destroyed it so we'll put this little check here so this w this should fail again but let's see what it says So special strings. There are no targets next to trials. That's a good that's a good string. So we want to keep that. That's good, informative. There are no targets next to trials. So we know that it won't do damage and it will play a trial. So if you click on this card and there's nothing, you know exactly what it's gonna do. And so now we have a complete test and a complete card. that because this is doing that all the comments are in order so let's move on to another card so let's make a quick copy of this card and work off that for speed's sake let's do the celestial adjudicator next so let me just get that card out so rename this this offshoot card here. Adjudicator. We'll get rid of this little trailing copy. We're gonna wanna clear out all of this because it's not the same thing, but just in just a moment. Celestial adjudicator card controller. We'll get to that in a second, but let's clear out most of this. Well, actually, before before we do that, let's look at what this does. We're going to go to Celestial Adjudicator here. Celestial Adjudicator. Reduce damage dealt to environment targets by one. At the start of the environment turn, reveal cards from the top of the environment deck until a trial is revealed. Put it into play, discard the red, the other revealed card. So that is very similar to what we just did. So we're actually going to keep some of that code at the bottom there, but we're going to change the context in which it happens. So at the start of the turn, we want it to just reveal cards and then play 
Yeah, reveal cards from the top until a trial is revealed. So we just want it to do this, and only that always. So we're going to get rid of that. So we already have that functionality. Cannot convert from phase change action. It's odd. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, but we will get back to that in a second. So let's add its other its other function. So its other function is to reduce damage. Reduce damage dealt to environment targets. Oh dear. My editor seems to be crashing a number of times. I guess it doesn't like streaming, but we'll work through it. So reduce damage dealt to environment targets by one. So we have a trigger for that. Here, let's close some of these other things. Oh! I'm working in the wrong file. That's what the problem is. Ah! Oh dear. My editor really doesn't like streaming. Just a moment. Let me just make sure that the stream is working, that the card is working. Okay, that all looks good. So the test passes, Celestial Executioner is all good. Let's go to the Adjudicator. And we want to do that change to the adjudicator. This is, let this be a cautionary tale of copying and pasting. You can end up working on the wrong thing. So, you know what I just noticed though? Even though it is working, one thing is not technically not accurate. The trigger type for the Celestial Executioner is not strictly deal damage there's a card that gets played. So we actually need to make it an array of trigger types. So new trigger type. And we're going to add another trigger type because it can play a card. Or is there a put into play? There is a put into play because technically that is different. Well, this one, however, only puts a card into play, so we don't need an array. We can just say, put into play. So now let's do the reduce damage. Reduce damage dealt to environment targets by one. So we're going to add a trigger, reduce damage. We have a trigger for this. So now the criteria, what damages get reduced? So we're going to give it deal damage action. Come back to that in a second. But there are a number of things that we can do here. We a number of helpers. And n luckily there's a nice and easy one. We can just pass it a number. And that's how much it's going to reduce. So let's look at these deal damage actions. We have to make sure that the deal damage is going to an environment target. So let's get target. Hmm. Seems to think that it's a card. Let me just check this. 
Okay, so yeah, this one actually helps us a little bit because we don't actually... This is the simplest trigger, and it knows that this only applies two cards. So reduce damage to cards that are environment targets. So as long as the target is environment, reduce damage to it. Handy. So now, let's go make sure that this is working. We're going to hop on over to our test document. We're going to make another test. Adjudicator. Adjudicator. It's a fun word to type. So now, we have the same test as before. We make that new game, and we play the Celestial Adjudicator. So let's test that the damage reduction is working properly. Oh, oh actually, just looking at this test, I realize there are no comments in this test. We have no idea what the cards are supposed to be doing. So I'm going to add those real quick. So, uh, Celestial Executioner deals three energy damage. Well, oh, hang on. Let's be start of the environment turn. So it's three energy damage to each target next to a trial. So that one is handy. And then here, we go further down. If no damage is dealt this way, play or reveal cards from the top of the environment deck uh, until a trial is revealed. Put it into play and discard the other cards. So now we know those are the two things that we're testing. So that's handy. And we can borrow this comment since we are going to be testing that in a bit. Or at least something similar. But for now, let's test the damage reduction. Reduce damage to environment targets by one. So let's deal damage. Uh, if you look at the new game, you'd know that Legacy is an available character. So we're going to have Legacy deal the Adjudicator, which has 12 hit points. Let's say 12. 12 damage. A punch really hard. And let's take into account the Adjudicator's HP beforehand. And afterhand. Afterward. Oh. So we want it to be minus 11. We don't want it to be dead. So, let's test it. We're gonna run all those Celestial Tribunal tests. All two of them. And they both pass, so let's take a look at this one in particular. Celestial Tribunal Adjudicator. Legacy Deal, Celestial Adjudicator, 11 melee damage. Because it reduced the damage dealt to Celestial Adjudicator by Legacy by one. So let's test this with another environment target. So let's play the Executioner. Call it EXE. That's a throwback. Well, not really. You still have EXEs. And now we're going to add the executioner here. And 
we're going to make see if the executioner, which has six hit points, takes damage. We're going to deal damage. Legacy executioner six melee punch. It's softer, but still pretty hard. Yep. So it's all environment targets. And just to be really sure that we don't mess anything up, let's also throw in Legacy's hit points. Legacy character card. And let's punch Legacy for very little damage. Let's say two. We want to make sure that we're not reducing damage from these cards. Let's punch Legacy for two energy damage. And he should take the full amount of it. And there we go. So that damage reduction looks like it is working nicely. So now, at the start of the environment turn, Dot, dot, dot. This is the long comment, so let's make it another line. We're going to go there. Go to start of turn environment. So we're going to want to stack the deck in a similar way to what we did before. And we actually... well, we can't. We can't actually borrow that. But since we don't actually need to... well, no, we should. Alright, so let's stack the deck. Bar. Deck stack. New list card. And we're going to probably don't need to check as many since we already have a test. So we're going to check just Celestial Chamber and uh, Found Wanting. Equals get card. Card. Found Wanting. We're going to We'll also chamber. Get card. The celestial chamber. And then we're gonna add them to the stack. Deck stack. Add found. And deck stack. Add chamber. And now we're gonna stack this deck. environment deck stack. Go to start of turn, environment. So then is in play, found wanting, assert in trash. Chamber. A similar test to what we had before. these cart this comment well that comment can stay where it is but see the test succeeds so that's good uh, and we don't need a special string here I don't think because uh, it doesn't there's no condition it always plays a trial every turn so there's nothing to look up so let's move on to something a little different Let's implement found wanting, since it's in so many of our tests. Found wanting. Ooh, I better be careful. I am, I am doing bad. Found wanting. Copy pasting. But can be effective sometimes. So, found wanting is drastically different than these other cards, so we will not need 
probably any of the same things. So we can get rid of that. And this. So let's see what found wanting does. Play this card next to a villain target, not next to a trial. Is it not already? No, not next to a trial. If there are no valid targets, discard this card. If the target next to this card leaves play, destroy this card. When this card is destroyed, play the top card of the environment deck. So, this top part can get a little bit complicated, and we'll model it after some other things that we have. So let's do the rest of this first. So, we can close that. And that. And these. Okay. So, if the target next to this card, next, this card leaves play, destroy this card. Alright, so that would be triggering on a leave play, target leaves play action. So let's add trigger target. So we probably don't have a helper for this, so we will be using a template, which is a very generic function, add trigger, and we're going to give it a target leaves play action, so that it knows to act on that. So, target leaves play, and we'll want some conditions, because it's not just any target leaving play, it is very specific. And in response, we will want it to destroy this card. That writes out nicely. We'll need to give it a trigger type, because it is doing a thing. That would be destroy. Destroy card. And we want to give it a timing. Well, most, most triggers require a timing. Let's see if this one does. My editor is being funny. Let's see. It's probably after. So yeah, if the target next to this card leaves play. So that, that reads as after to me. So let's add some conditions. behaving funny. I should probably reset my editor. It really does not like streaming. So, apologies. The screen will go black for just a moment. Okay, that's much better. So now let's give this a condition. So, target leaving play. So let's take a look at exactly what target is leaving play, and let's make sure that it is the card... That this is get card this card is next to. So, if the target leaving play is the card that this card is next to, then do the rest of this stuff. Something is... Yeah, we're comparing card and card. I don't know why the rest of this is freaking out. Oh, because it wants... It passes a parameter the target leaving play action. We don't need to do anything with it, but it is passing it. We gotta acknowledge that it's passing it. So now, this should 
uh, if the target is destroyed, leave play. So let's do a little more here, so and then we can test the whole card at once. So when this card is destroyed... Play the top card of the environment deck. So let's add a trigger. Uh, destroy. Add when destroyed trigger. So now we'll give it a response. Something to do. So destroy card. And we want it to play top card of deck. The environment. So find the environment. And we want to play the top, just the top card. The rest of these parameters that this function wants, we don't need. Except maybe show message. So let's let's have it show a message. So we know the player knows what's going on here. And then we gotta give it a trigger type, which is play card. So those two triggers do the bulk of what this card does. Now we need to add something a little bit special so that we can determine where this card gets played. So for some similarities, we can jump over to Chrono Ranger and his bounties. So let's look at a Chrono Ranger bounty. More specifically, the parent of all bounties. Because all bounties inherit from this card. And because they all do the same thing. Play this card next to another card. So with this function, determine play location, you f normally it goes to the play area of whatever deck is playing it. So instead, let's determine where it goes. And we'll copy this and we'll, we'll gut it and change it. But it is important that we have it. Something is weird with my editor. Okay, so instead of selecting where it goes, we want to play this card next to a villain target, not next to a trial. So theoretically, we can select where this goes. So let's look at... We want a criteria. Because this can go next to any villain target, not next to a trial. So that sounds like our criteria to me. Link card criteria. And we want it to be card is villain. Card is a target. Note that we haven't been asking if cards are targets before because we're dealing damage, and damage can only go to targets. But we, now we need to specify since this has nothing to do with damage. And we want to make sure that C next to location cards where next to card is not a trial, is trial, except not. Oops, that's further down. And we want to make sure that the count... Well, actually, we can check, we can find cards where so see next to location, cards where there is a trial. And we can just check to that, make sure that that count is zero rather than greater than zero. Because if it's zero, that means there are no trials next to it. So then the description here would be cards, uh, well it would be villain targets without 
with no trials or er, hmm. without trials. We will make sure it doesn't use the cards suffix. So now, whenever this card gets played, we should get a decision to put it next to villain targets. So now let's hop on over to our tests. So first things first, we're probably going to have to change this test here. The Celestial Executioner, because we have it manually moving this card for us. So that can be sort of like our first test by removing that and making sure it goes next to a target. If this test still passes, then we know it's working. Well, we'll still want to write a test for it, but this will test the waters. Okay, something is working. So now, here's what happened. We played Found Wanting, we moved it and moved it next to Baron Blade without asking any questions. Because, at the time, Baron Blade was the only villain target, I think. Yep, when we played Found Wanting, the Blade Battalion was not in play, so there was no decision. It could only go one place. And so now the test is failing. So let's move it down. So now, in this test, we should see a decision. It'll probably still go to Baron Blade, since it defaults to the first option. Yep but we can choose between them. So now, if here we assert that uh, so this select card for next decision battalion. So when it gets played, it gets rid of that, and then we can clear decisions, reset decisions. Because so, we don't want to select blade battalion for everything after that. <laughs> So now, the test passes. That's a good indicator that it's working. Let's scroll up. So, select card decision of type move card next to Baron Blade or Blade Battalion. And we choose Blade Battalion, so it works. Huzzah. Now let's write its own test. Clear all this stuff for found. We're going to play this next to Baron Blade. Well, actually, it's probably better not to play it again next to him to test the other functions. So let's. Battalion. I know how to spell that word now. should know it already, but I didn't. So now we want to do the same thing with this where we where we select card for next decision battalion. And we want to remove reset the decision making, so it's not a problem. So now it'll play next to them. And here well, actually, above this, let's put the comment about what it should be doing at that time. So, found wanting. We can put it here. In the card itself. And in the test. And we'll give it a, an accurate name. Now, let's assert that this card, found wanting, is next to the Blade Battalion. Oh, I forgot that my text got smaller again. I apologize for that. 
Um, and now let's run this test. We'll run all of them, see if they work. Found wanting move from the environment deck next to Blade Battalion. That looks good. So next step. Now we destroy Blade Battalion. And several things should happen. First of which is that found wanting should go to the trash. Because it destroys itself. And second of which, a card gets played. So let's let's make sure let's make another check. So since we only care about the top card now, we don't have to do anything nearly as fancy. So let's just say adjudicator is on the top card. And stack deck environment. We can just say, okay, we want adjudicator on the top of the deck. So now we want to assert is in play adjudicator, and that should happen. It's the top card of the deck. It gets played, and it works. Destroyed. Plays itself. So that another one bites the dust. We've gotten through, like, a good amount of this deck. There's not actually a whole lot, whole, whole big number of cards here. Lots of duplicates. So let's do the other, well not the other, but one of the other trials. Let's do Paragon of Sentience. Paragon of Sentience. Let's read what this card does before we get into the meat. Play this card next to a hero character card, not next to a trial. We got one of those. We got something already similar to that, except for villain. Villain target. If there are no valid targets, discard this card. If the target next to this card leaves play, destroy this card. When this card is destroyed, play the top card of the environment deck. That is almost identical to the card we just made. So, literally the only thing that we do that is different is is hero character card. And we want to change the comments too. So let's see. Yep, the target next to this card leaves play. So when a car hero character card becomes incapacitated, that counts as leaving play. Doesn't have to be like removed from the table. Or the target leaves play, that is. The card itself stays. When this card is destroyed, play top card in the environment deck. Oh, that's the same. So let's hop over to our test. It'll be almost exactly the same. I just typed Celestial Tribunal like a, a idiot. test Paragon of Sentience, and I did not spell it sentence even though I was thinking it in my head. So 
So here. So select card for next decision. We still want that. Because we want to pick a hero card. We want to make sure that this doesn't go to any old hero target. So we will want... Let's step into our new game real quick and look. We got Legacy, we got the Wraith, we got Tempest. None of these people can play uh, hero targets. So we luckily have this parameter here, extra heroes. Let's throw in an extra hero. Uh, extra heroes. And so we give it a string array because you can add up to two extras. Let's see, who should we throw in there? Hmm. Anyone in the chat have any ideas? Not seeing anything. So, unless I see something in the next second, I'm going to go with Captain Cosmic. There it is. So I'm going to make sure it's an array. Captain Cosmic. So, we want to play... Construct. So let's see. Far weapon equals card. cosmic weapon. And that can go wherever it wants. But it should not be one of our options. Hmm. So what's a way that we can guarantee we can check to make sure that the cosmic weapon isn't what gets the card while also selecting from the heroes. So I guess we'll have to pick a hero. Let's go with Tempest. Cert is next to Tempest. Now we'll want to figure out a way to make sure that that was not one of the options. So let's see if there's a helper for that. So, not... Hmm. Assert not decision. Hmm. We might not actually have a helper for this. Right, let's see. Choices. Assert number of choices shown in next decision. There we go. That's what we want. So, number of choices should be four, not five. We play the Paragon of Sentience, it goes to 1 of 4, it goes to Tempest. So then here we'll deal a lot of damage to Tempest. So Baron is feeling less than charitable to his alien uh, attacker. And he's going to deal 100 energy damage. And we want to assert that Paragon of Sentience is in the trash. So that looks like a good test to me. Let's run everything. Again, we don't want to run everything, this whole list, but it's good to run like the deck, the whole deck when you add something new. Ooh, something changed. Let's see. Uh, 
Ah, are we playing a card that we should not be playing here? Celestial Executioner. We shouldn't be playing Paragon of Sentience. Let's run this again, just to be sure. Yeah, okay, so we want to ensure that we don't have Paragon of Sentience in there anywhere, because that will mess up the Celestial Executioner test. This is why it's good to run all the tests. So let's see. All the places where cards should get played. So Found Wanting gets played here. Start of turn. It deals damage, so it doesn't play a card. Here. Let's run this a couple more times just to be sure. Hmm. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, and I used that twice today. Aha! Oh, you know what it is? Found Wanting is getting destroyed and playing a card. So we gotta stack the deck there too. So stack, deck, uh, what do we even want to put here? Something that won't interfere with our test at all. So something that we can easily destroy. Let's do another Executioner. We'll call this one EXE. Execute gets to live. EXE gets to die. Oh no. Oh dear. My editor is crashing again. Yeah, it, it can be useful to test the tests because... These are the things that when you make a tiny change that affects everything in the future, you can go back and like, did I break anything important? And these tests will tell you yes or no. So you want them to be nice and robust. There we go. Now it's working. So. The deck is environment. The executioner is exe, and we gotta get. So we're gonna get another celestial executioner, and we're gonna stack the deck, and they should enter play and then we will destroy them again. Now we should move this down because it is more relevant to the things below it than it is above it. So let's go back and see if this test still works. Environments, Celestial Tribunal, go, there. So everything is working. Everything is coming up Millhouse. Let's run this one a couple, couple more times just to be sure, because it was flaky before. That's all good, and let's just run this again so we can take a look at it. So what happens? We play the Cosmic Weapon. Uh, we don't specify which card to go next to. We should... wait. Oh, that's for Cosmic Weapon. So yeah, Paragon of Sentience gets played. Cosmic Weapon is not an option. We stack the deck, we incapacitate Tempest, Paragon of Sentience plays the top card of the environment deck, Celestial Adjudicator, and destroys itself. Perfect. So let's see, we got 
ten minutes approximately, a little bit less. So I think that we can probably do the Celestial Chamber as well. So let's do it. Last card of the day. Well, of the stream. <laughs> Hop over to Power on the Sentience. So this card will be completely different, but it's nice to have a base. Celestial Chamber. Boy, howdy, my editor is just throwing a fit today. In case you can't tell, this is the first time that I've streamed with the editor running. <laughs> Editors can be a little bit memory hungry. And now my editor is not re recognizing the shift key. That is the weirdest thing that I've ever seen this editor do. I've seen it do some weird stuff. The Celestial Chamber, there we go. Let's take a look at what this does. At the start of the environment turn, move one tribunal AI card from the environment trash into play. At the end of the environment turn, if there are no trials in play, play the top card of the deck. Uh, and I'm just looking at the comments. Uh, it is Xamarin Studio, so it is similar to uh, the mono develop, but not the same. Mono develop being the Unity editor. So Celestial Chamber, let's get this stuff. Put it in comments here. We're gonna gut this. We don't need determined play location anymore. It knows where it's going. So it has a something at the start of the environment turn. So that'll be a little more complicated, so we'll want a little handler for that. We'll come back to it though. So let's add start of turn trigger. We want it to be the environment turn. Turn taker is environment. We want the response to be start, turn, response, just like before. Trigger type. We are going, is it a move card? Put into play. Yes, it is put into play. Move one card from the environment trash into play. I would call that put into play. I could be wrong, and I may have to go back and fix that. But I'll stick to it for now. Start of turn response. And we want a phase change action. So now we want to look in the trash and put a card into play. A Tribunal AI card, specifically. So let's see if there's a helper. Uh, trash into play? No, there isn't. So we're gonna have to look. Let's actually do start with a check. To see if there are even any car Tribunal AI cards in the trash. Find cards where. So we want card is environment since only 
that that's the only kind of card they can be. And a card is in trash, so it's in the environment trash. Now we want to make sure is tribunal AI. So if is trial is not quite right, but we actually have to add something here. So all these little functions that check to make sure that a card is a certain keyword or has a certain keyword, we'll have to add keyword tribunal AI. So let's make sure that that's the same as it is in the deck list because we don't want any disparities. Here we go. Tribunal AI. Ah, the periods are in it. So In the shorthand we can make it one word, but it's important those match. So now here we're going to add something to the bottom here. Similar. Except instead of his position, is Tribunal AI. Do keywords contain keyword Tribunal AI. So now we can check if the card is a Tribunal AI. So we get any cards that are Tribunal AIs, or we check to make sure they exist at least. And if they do, So, I'm going to go check on actually a character that does this, or is something similar to this, just to make sure that we're doing it consistently. Termination Unity. So, select card from a location and move it. Move a mechanical golem from your trash into play. So, this is what we want. So. Our little E will be, so you return to your controller, decision maker. So basically it's a community decision. The location is this.turntaker.trash. Oh, it looks like time might be up. So I think that it might be time to switch over to the other half of this stream. Let me just check in with them real quick. So I apologize, you won't get to see the rest of that card. Well, in the meantime, until I hear from them, I'll keep going. Oh! I just heard from them. I apologize. So it's been nice streaming for you. Oh, they just gave me well, hmm. It'll take more than a few minutes. So It's been a pleasure streaming for you. And we have some good stuff in store for you in the second half. More celestial tribu tribunal, but of a different sort. So, it's been fun, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Um, I am waiting to see. It does not show that I'm online yet. Oh, there it went live. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to close that. All right. So today we're going to take... Um, well, first of all, thank you for sticking around for my part of the stream. Um, David gave a great talk about building the cards for a Celestial Tribunal. So now we're going to take a look at how the 3D environment for a Celestial Tribunal is going to get made. Um, so the first thing I want to do is take a look at the card art. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it before, Celestial Tribunal is this giant spaceship. Uh, and... It was controlled by robots, but they also capture and hold 
various um, creatures and people in it. Uh, so I'm not going to be building the exterior of the spaceship today. We're going to be focusing on the, the rooms inside, but um, just for reference, this is this is the, the deck back card art. And um, now let's take a look at some of the other card art from the Celestial Tribunal. So um, the Celestial Chamber is one of the cards. Uh, and for the Celestial... The, Celestial Tribunal, there's not that many cards, but they're very, very, um, they're very descriptive, I guess. The art, the artwork is visually, uh, it shows what we want, what things are supposed to look like. So I think I'm going to start on um, trying to build this part of the environment today. Um, as you can see, there's like these structures with glowing green and cables hanging around and, um, uh, it's all very large, you know, because you can see in this picture there's like a, a human type figure here, and these are all giant compared to the person. And so let's go through all these artworks. So this is um, this card is called to judgment. It's kind of sideways, but you can see there's like one of these platforms, which I don't know if I'll get to putting one of those in today, but we're gonna get hit. But there's a few cards that have these uh, on them. Um, and Celestial Adjudicator has more of these glowing green things in the background. Celestial Executioner has, looks like, like a desk or something. Um, more cables and green. There's lots of green glowing things in this environment. And Character Witness has another one of these stands on it. Um, here we have like a doorway, a very specific doorway with some glowing green things in, in set in the wall and sticking out of it. Uh, found wanting has like floating screens and more cables and green glowing. Paragon of Sentience once again has these like glowing green lines in the background. Representative of Earth. We've got, I guess, another doorway or entrance to the, this particular room. Celestial Chamber. And that is the card art. Um, so first, so after I went through the card art, the first thing I did with this, the next, the, I should say, not the first thing, the next thing I did was I um, made a, a list of the different things, um, my preliminary ideas about what, it, how, what should be in this environment. So it's obviously it's, it's, there's a lot of green glowing things. It's sort of like Omnitron 4 in the sense that it, robots live there. Um, but it's also a lot like the mobile defense platform and where, you know, and has some elements of like Wagner Mars space and Freedom Tower and like, this outer space, this, this, this sci-fi environment, but like there's robots and it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's the own unique thing. Um, but we, you know, we're going to, we can recycle some of the assets we used in the other environments and make them just change the way they look a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, I made a list of my initial thoughts on what camera angles to show and what things we'll need, but all right, so now I'm really excited to do, go behind the scenes in Unity, um, in, in, like very early, uh, set, early development in the environment. Because usually I'm, the, I'm the, usually the only person that sees this part of the um, development cycle on the environment. Sometimes I'll show share screenshots uh, internally, but uh, this is this is exciting because I know if you know if you've been, I will actually I will make this smaller so we can see the chat still. Um, if anyone has questions, as always, feel free to um, post them in the chat, and I will try to answer them. All right. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about how the um, project is structured. So I have a couple things in here, and as you can see when I zoom out, there's it like it turns greener, and that's because I have a fog. In the, I set up fog in the lighting. Um, 
And actually, I'll probably, I don't think you put that in the other scene. So I will get that color. And close that. Um, so there's a few things in here, and I've already added in a couple cameras. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty sparse in here. It doesn't really look, it doesn't look like, uh, like card art yet, but um, I'm just starting to lay things out. So wait, and then there's another scene. So this, this scene, this is the Slow Steel Tribunal scene. And then I have a demo scene. And as you can see, there's nothing in here except, you know, the stars in the background. But when I press play, it's going to show me the cameras that I've set up and I can cycle through them. And there's only three cameras right now. And as you can see, they're very unfinished, but let's see. I don't think I have fog added yet in here. Nope. So I will stick the fog in here. It doesn't really make, it's not going to really make a difference right now, but it will make a big difference later on when there's more more objects and they go further further back in to the field um, so let's, let's just test this out to make sure that it looks right yeah now it's looking like the other scene um still has a ways to go but that is and then from the demo scene, I can do um, cap is where I capture the actual cameras. All right. So camera, so still chamber. So I'm gonna turn the lights off for. Oh. I'm actually gonna turn the fog off for the moment in here to make it easier to see everything. So these these are kind of placeholder. Um, textures on the the walls and floor right now but I was just laying it out and uh, you know I have a few of these structures in here and I'm gonna so I really want to have a camera that looks like the scene and I may add a, a shadowy figure in at some point um, I might not so you know there's like the that kind of piece on one side and then this is like floating this one it looks like it's floating or being hung from the ceiling by cables we don't really know but it's it's gonna get cut off um, by the camera but we can do it in here and actually uh, well yeah I, I I tend to keep the um, cameras in a square I'm gonna actually close that so it's not blinking at us um, because that's the way they're captured because they're put into the um, the game is square textures and then they're cropped you know based on the size of the window that they're put into but let's probably gonna just call this structure so we can move this i will turn off these cameras for the moment all right, so you can pull this back and let's rotate it a little bit. You know, and the digital, the 3D environments, you know, they're not usually like exactly like the card art, but I like to use the card art as a reference to make it, you know, to at least inspire the, the 3D background. Um, It's a nice way to tie things into the game. So, now, no, I guess for now. Oops. And it looks like I moved it too close and it's all out of whack. All right. So we got that, and then this doesn't really look big enough, so let's go ahead and make that a little bigger. That's pretty large, and there's gonna be more of those. Put a couple more of them further back. 
into the distance and then this this structure was in one of the packs and it kind of looked like it fit in with its glowing green um, images and when we turn the fog back on you'll see that it kind of obscures some of these things um, you know if I move this way back here suddenly it's you know, you can still see it, but it's more faded out. Um, and we may want to make the fog thicker because um, looking at, at these and some of them, or we can also obscure things with lights too, um, which is probably what we're going to do for these closer in pieces. Um, the other thing I, in this, this view, there's lots of cables hanging from the ceiling and um, I'll probably want to get some more variety of cables, but um, these cables were already they were already made in one of the packs, and so just to get an idea, we can oops, stick some more of these in. But as you can see, they only go so far. Um, so I'm going to need to get some longer cables at some point, but for now, these will get the point across. Now the lights, um, I guess I'll talk for a second about how I have more things organized over here. Um, I have the cameras in a group. Um, the lights should be in a group, so we're going to make a group for the lights. Called some lights. Right now, there's two directional lights in the scene. I'll get rid of these four panels. Are those are things I was going to. Well, we might want those for something else. Um, Later. So I'm not going to delete them quite yet, but let's get them out of the main, the main list of things. So we have the cameras, the lights, um, and then groups for each group of, for each area, you know, like depending on the environment, sometimes I'll have like all the props for each camera and a separate group in the hierarchy or, um, but it, it kind of depends. And, it usually, you know, I'll reorganize it as, as I go, it, you know, as I get further into development. But um, at this at this stage, you know, there's not there's not that whole lot in here yet. Um, make that look better over here. Let's see. Yeah, All right, so, oh, I was starting to talk about the lights and then I got distracted. I, I don't know, this is probably my my favorite part of um, building the environments is like getting thing like the initial laying out of like the, the cameras and the different scenes. Um, and then, you know, that part, you know, sometimes goes quickly, sometimes it doesn't. And then there's a lot of fine tuning after that. Um, but this is this is the exciting part because we're like really setting the setting the course for how the environment is going to get developed. So we have two directional lights right now in the scene. Um, I'll turn them both off so we can see what they're both doing. Let's see. So this one is not casting any shadows; it's just kind of lighting up things. Um, it's actually kind of cool when everything's dark. Um, because you can just see like the green glowing pieces, which actually might might be a way to do this. Because they aren't really casting shadows in any of these pictures. Well, there are shadows in some of the figures. Maybe I'll tone down the lights rather than making it super bright. Because um, that brightens it a lot. It's, it's already as much as that. Let's put it at point two. So it adds some, you know, general lighting, but doesn't brighten things up too much. And then we have this camera, which is actually casting shadows. Um, and it's coming from the other direction, which 
is cool for this angle, but you know, if we look at it from from the back, it's doing some strange things. But we could, but this, you know, that camera is not final. It's just kind of you can have it pointing at something else when we get to that point. So. Um, Let's see, so we got a bunch of these like towering things and then a structure that's sort of like this and then one that's sort of rounded on top, which we'll look for in the pack. So, oops. Right now, the you know, the background, I have this giant wall just so you you know, don't see the stars in the background, um, but, you know, you don't really need to see the wall for this particular setup. Um, actually, I'm gonna move that further, further back here. Yeah, look at that. Ooh, it fades out nicely, like, it is in, like, it's so far away because this is such a massive uh, chamber of horrors, so. And then let's find something that sort of looks like that. So we've got a whole bunch of different asset packs in here. Um, this is a new one that we haven't used in any other environments yet. Unfortunately, it has the um, <laughs> the pieces each in their own separate. separate folder. Um, this isn't the right place to be looking. These are cool. We'll make you use of this sort of thing for other parts of this environment. I know I've seen that sort of thing somewhere else. It's containers. Oh, look at these. There we go. That's kind of cool. If we change some of the colors around, that might add to these. It'd be a nice addition to these um, cylindrical pillar things. Let's let's stick this in here and see what it looks like in here. All right. Well, that's pretty tiny. Yeah. So sometimes when you got buy pre-made assets, they are great, and sometimes they need some work. So let's see how this is separated out. Oh, it looks like it has different pieces on different um, different layers. I don't see any part of this that's green. But Here's another way we can do it. If we want to make it the same dark gray as the other structures, and some of them are lighter gray, but you know, I made some materials for those. Let's see. Ooh, that's a little dark, but you can kind of. Make it look like it fits in better. Um, like about a green glow and these various pieces of it. Ooh, look at that. It's a little bit crazy now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, probably not want to put it there. But in these, oops, now the floor is green. Let's make everything green. That would actually be pretty fun if the whole environment was bright green. Have it Probably make it easier to build. Maybe a quicker video. Ah, something weird is going on on the top here, so that can all become green, I guess. Or... Or gray. So just for some variety, you know, there's another, there's another structure. I can stick her in here somewhere. 
you know, and also in other scenes. But... Or other cameras, I should say. Because it's all in the same scene. All right. Maybe. But really, I'm really looking for uh, something. But this is fairly specific, so I may end up, uh, you know, may end up making custom versions of some of these things and something with like lines. And we also need pipes connecting these to the ground. Um, Is that for like the sort of thing that's back there? I remember in this scene, let's see if it's tough. Hmm, okay, this is a different pack than I was thinking of. Yeah, I'm getting some weird glitching with the visuals. In here. Let's take a look at the uh, speech station pack, maybe. So here's a whole bunch more. It's red dot cables that we're using. Can't go wrong with that. Oops. That's kind of a neat, uh, a neat thing. Might be useful in some of some other some of these other videos. <sighs> yeah, that's actually in there right now. That's what uh, what that building is. Um, these, these ones I made to, cause they were simple and they look, you know, they were fairly specific to hard art. Let's see if I can see if I look at something here. But yeah, I got some nice, uh, sci-fi doorways. Or when we was it um so um in the chat the chat asks how long does it take to make that sort of custom model uh well it depends um so like these particular ones are not you know not are not all that complicated uh um so they didn't they didn't really take that long. Like this one, I honestly, I, this one is actually all made up of cylinders. I built it right in, um, right in Unity, um, which is, it's always kind of cool when, when that works out. So I rotated myself out of, so I can actually like show you how this, like these are actually just cylinders that are stuck in place um and like that's a separate piece and the green glowing one is a separate piece um because the you know i was because i was looking at the card art and i was like wow that's really looks really cool um and it's an easy thing to build so i did it um this one i i can actually i can open that up in cinema 40 and show you what i did there i um it was it was a pretty simple one to build. 
Um, you can see in the model, the, the, the colors don't, it doesn't look so good in, in the default colors. But I'll um, do this here so I can see it. So it's just, it's one model. Um, I started with a cylinder. I divided it up into, you know, into sections. And then I set two different materials on the model. So like you have these insets and I made those green on the inside and um, extruded them inwards. And, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. It's not, you know, it's not, when it's at this stage, it's obviously, it's not done. It still needs more stuff to be added on to it. But, um, you know, the, the things like the pipes, I figured I would add in Unity. Um, you know, I may go back in and add these cracks or flowing lines. Um, actually, it might make sense for me to just do that now while I'm thinking about it. Um, if I want to be really close to, the, you know, if I want to be really close to the card art. But, um, get another question in the chat. Are you redoing the card art in 3D? Um, so I think I mentioned it earlier. Um, we don't, I don't, we don't typically recreate every single card art in 3D, but I use them as inspiration for the environment. And in the case of Celestial Tribunal, the card art is, um, is very good and very descriptive of what the environment looks like. Um, you know, some environments, it, it, you know, it's harder to tell what the, what the environment looks like, but, um, you know, like this particular card, like it's very clear, like this is this giant room and there's all these things in it. Um, you know, some of the, like, like this card, well, I mean, they're all, they're all actually really good for this environment. Um, cause they all have some elements of the background in them, um, to draw inspiration from and use as reference. Um, but, it, you know, they're not intended in any way to replace the card art because the cards are still in the game. Um, you're still playing with the cards. And this, these are just, like, the things that show up behind the um, heroes. And, you know, it's sometimes it's better if they are not the same as the cards because, you know, they're in the background. And then the card that they're referencing isn't necessarily in play. It's just these are things that are in the environment that the heroes are inside of. Um, so... Actually, I'll go ahead and I'll add add that little little line in while I'm in in here. Uh, it looks like it. It just like it goes in and then it goes up, and the same on the bottom. But actually, it looks like it's going straight down and then it like turns to the left. But for the moment, I can just, I'll just make it. Let's try it out. So, start with the first one. That's going to be in like this area, roughly. Not exactly, but maybe a little bit more over here. And, you know, we don't know if it wraps around the top or what happens to it. And we're not really going to see the top of this in the scene. Um, at least not in this camera. Uh, and, you know, if it's an issue, well, we can move it around later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let's see. Through there. And let's move this around a little bit. Actually, suppose we do want it to go all the way to the top. And I'm going to turn off the specular glow on this and, <laughs> and I'm going to get a little darker so it's easier to see what's going on. All right. So it kind of like. Let's close that. 
So it kind of like goes up and then to the left and then up. And a lot of them have like, you know, there's a lot of these lines that kind of go everywhere. And, um, you know, there were lines similar to this sort of thing in Onatron 4, and I actually put those in with the textures um, rather than actually modeling them in because there were just so many of them. Um, they were all over everything. Um, and I think I'll probably end up making a texture that looks like that um, for this environment. I might, I may do that. Um, if I get to it today, I may do that. Um, that might make more, it might, might make sense to do that next. So this is pretty narrow on the car. Oops. Well, that's just looking all kinds of funny, isn't it? And then it shifts. Okay. Yeah, I get the very, very general idea. It's not um, to rub it in. I may go back and refine this later on, but we can get the general idea in and if we want it to extend all the way to the top. Get out the knife tool. And I kind of want that to extend all the way back here, too. So I kind of, you know, it's not exactly the way it is on the card, but we're going to get the general idea. Yeah, and hopefully without, you know, breaking my mesh. Um, but actually, there is enough going on here that I'm going to go ahead and make that the place where it, um, where it shifts over. Instead, I think it'll look a little better. All right. And I actually made that sink in a little bit, but it won't matter in a moment when we see what I'm going to do. All right, so we already have this green glow um, selected on here. And so what I'm going to do, oh, well, actually, yeah, well, I'll do this first. So I will add this to that selection. So that's how it looks right now. Um, just on the surface. I'll go ahead and get rid of those. And they're just kind of hanging out, taking up space. But, you know, the, the mesh is going to get triangulated in when it gets exported into um, Unity anyway, but
it's easier to, you know, it's better to keep things clean. All right, so we have that green stripe there, but, you know, much like the other pieces are inset, it's kind of inset a little bit, and we're going to want to have a glow coming out of it, and it'll look a little better if we... Have it move inside a little bit. So, so now I have that. Oh, it's not completely selected. Let's see. I have extrude it inside. So now it's set in a little bit into the side of this. Um, looks all right in here. I will. Um, so this is the Cinema 4D file is like my working file. Um, it's kind of the way I've been doing it, and the the model that's actually used in the environment. I'm making hand gestures as if anyone can see me. Um, is going to be an FBX file because um, you know in case someone else is ever using this project and they don't have Cinema 4D installed, um, they'll be able to still see it in the project. So let's give it a minute to load and now it has that green green glowing stripe at the top of it. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and add one at the bottom. And then yeah, let's see. So at the bottom it's kinda doing the same thing except towards the bottom. Um, Want to line up what else that's in here. So I will do inner extruder to get started. And yeah. And then I'll chop it up a little bit. And make that go in. So, yeah, it is farther left, actually. Um, but so we can we can shift it over a little bit in here. I'm not super worried about that. So it is now slightly to the left. And I will chop it up. Is that going? Yeah, I know it's supposed to be going. Actually over here. I'll get rid of this so I don't confuse myself. a little bit more extreme now than on the top, but it doesn't necessarily have to match exactly because, you know, it's also important to remember that these are going to be in the background and yeah. 
but I want it to look as good as I can always. So And you know, it's also, th this is a fairly simple model, um, all things considered, which is, um, and there's a lot of little things to, you know, there's a lot of little nitpicky things that, um, you know, to work on with this, which is why, um, since I'm the only environment artist, we buy a lot of stuff pre-made, um, Because otherwise it would never all get done. <laughs> well, I mean, it would eventually get done, but it would take a lot longer. Um, it speeds up production a lot. So that's the general idea. Um, it's not an exact match for the top, but it isn't on the card either. So yeah, I get the general idea across. So I'll go ahead and make that green. And then I'll push it in a little bit. So I might have pushed it in too far. No, maybe not, actually. That... No, not bad. Um, you know, I may go back later and add those on the other side or adjust these, but for, for the moment, um, you know, because the focus my focus today is really like getting everything laid out, but um I thought I would do that while I was thinking about it since it wasn't a super it wasn't you know a real hard thing to do so and that should look okay hopefully once it loads into Unity all right so yeah get the general idea is there and uh all right so i haven't found this exact sort of thing so i'm gonna put some placeholder objects in there for the moment um until i find the right or until i find or make the right thing to go there so There's sort of like a round thing there and then a thing like that and then this other thing that isn't really round um more of a cylinder and we can just use this for now So we just have something that's the right sort of shape. And actually, that doesn't look so bad. Um, it kind of fits in with everything else. So at least for the moment, I think that that works. And this guy can be bigger and further back. All right. So the general idea for the first camera laid out. Um, now one thing that isn't quite right is the lighting in the front. You can see like the the shadow from the cables and you know in the, in the card art and this camera and in a lot of other ones it seems like there's almost like a like a green smoke or haze at the bottom. So there's a couple ways we can do that. Um, One, one, one thing I can do is I can make a, a point light there with a, 
be low on it. And actually, before I go further with that, let's organize some of the stuff in here. So we have that barrel is in the celestial chamber. And oh, look at all these different things. Um, I'm actually going to make another object, empty object, which is sort of like a holder for all the structures to keep myself organized because otherwise this hierarchy can get pretty, pretty messy. Um, so everything that's like a Then actually I'll probably make another one for another um, object to hold all the cables in too because there's, by the time we're done with this, there's going to be a lot of them. Then I get all the structures in there. Oh, now I missed that ball. Where is it? Here it is. And let's make another one. For the cables. And right now there's like three different cables, but there's gonna, or three different cable objects, but there's gonna be a lot more. So what's in there? What's this reactor? Oh, that's also a structure. Okay. And then floor, wall, floor, and yeah, we'll leave those for the moment. And this light inside of the celestial chamber. So what okay I have a question from the chat. Um why do you put them in Unity instead of just working in Cinema 4D? Um so I guess yeah so if you're not familiar with um the software I'm using I, I should probably explain what um, I'm gonna save my I'm gonna actually save my project while I'm thinking about it. It's always a good idea in case something crashes. Um, Cinema 4D is 3D modeling software. Um, so it's, you know, I can model objects in there and animate objects. Um, don't really animate objects for the environments anymore since they're just still images um, in the game. Unity is the game engine and it's the way that we capture the environments and um, the lighting systems are really nice and it's also when we buy you know asset packs from the unity asset store they're designed to be opened up in unity um so there's a lot more flexibility with arranging things in unity than there is in um i mean theoretically i could build the entire project in cinema 4d and set up cameras and capture it in there um it's just not the way that we've been doing it um yeah, there's, there's a lot of advantages to using Unity. Um, and the other nice thing, too, is, like, I could make, like, a standalone build of this um, where someone could, you know, we could just, like, press the buttons and look at the different cameras, um, which I do sometimes, um, like, when we're building, if we're building, um, if we need the environments for, like, a trailer or something, I'll, you know, make a standalone build and give it to Jeremy or Krista to, to use to, you know, capture the different screens in different ways. Um, so yeah, that is what we do it this way. And then, all right, so I was gonna put this, like, some green haze in the front. So the first thing I'm gonna try is, so this is a point light in Unity and put a halo on it, it puts this weird glow around it and I can make that glow green. And actually, I've been noticing like these are more of a bluer green than what I have in uh, is the glow right now. So I sh I'm going to change that to match this kind of a green more um, before I go further. Because this is kind of a, you know, this green has, has, it's, I mean, it's closer to blue in this little bar here, but I can move it a little bit up and that looks a little bit more like the card art. And I'm going to copy this color and put it on this point light to see what that looks like. And it might work and it might not. Oops. And I'm being tweeted about right now. Yay, that's always exciting. All right, so now 
you get that kind of it's starting to get that like green otherworldly glowy glow happening and I can make that bigger or more intense um, ooh, that's kind of cool it's a little too much though and I can oops I accidentally deleted it I meant to copy it And I can have a second glowing ball over there, um, <laughs> which looks okay in the square, but I suspect probably wouldn't look as great if it was widescreen. Yeah. I mean, it, and, you know, since I'll be capturing more, and so right away, I'll put another one off over here in case, just to make it all balanced. So now it's starting to um, have that, like, I'm trying to get the same, like, mood of the glow, but there's also, like, these weird smoky things. So I think I might add in a particle system um, with some smoke to thicken the atmosphere. All right. So I will... particle system. So the default particle system in Unity looks like that, which is not exactly um, what I'm going for. What I'm looking for is something that's more going to, well, it looks like it goes all the way up. Um, there's probably going to be a few different particle systems in here, but I'm going to make one that's just along the ground right now. So um, those of you not familiar with particle systems unity, there's a lot of different things that can be adjusted. Um, so the first thing I do this shape right now is going out in a cone shape. So I'm going to change that to a box. In that way, I can make the box. Oops. Extend all the way across the floor grabbing the wrong side of it, I guess. Well, maybe not the whole floor. So let's... That looks like about... Oops. And I accidentally just moved things around in... Uh, oh, fun times. The nice thing about the drag and drop... Uh, interface is that you can move things around. The bad thing is then you can accidentally move things around, which happens a lot. So I can also do that. Yeah, and the, the X, Y, and Z in here are kind of funny. Because um, in the Unity editor, Y is up and then X and Z are, you know, on the flat plane and then Y is up. But in here, for some reason the particle system, it's the other way around and, and Z is up and down. So, oh, let's see. But we don't necessarily want these to be floating up, but we can make them maybe just float up slower. They need to be a lot bigger than that. Um, so let's say, to 10. But they start at 10 and they go to 15. Yeah, look at that. And uh, gray and make the white more transparent. So, all right. So that's that's doing something interesting. Um, not quite what we wanted yet, but. You know, starting to get the idea that we're gonna make it gray and gray, or maybe even green. Um, a bit of a green glow. There's probably way too many of the particles, also. Um, next particle is a thousand right now. We can make it five hundred. We can make it one hundred. We can make it five. Oops, not eighty-five. Five. And suddenly, there's a lot less of it. And most useful. Alright, 
And we also want, so I should also explain. So like this top section, that's the editor. And then this bottom section is what it will look like in the actual game or in our capture of it. Um, so we don't want to be using the default particle image. We're going to, we want to use a better material. And I know that there's some smoke in here, maybe not called smoke. But I know there's some different particles that are already in the project somewhere that would look better than what I have. I guess that wasn't called smoke. Or maybe I'm thinking of a different project and there's actually not any in here. Um, a uh, question from the chat saying, have you made models of the characters too? And the answer is no, I have not. Um, that would be really cool. I would like to do that, but it has not been a thing um, that we have done for the game because um, the characters in the, in the game are, you know, still, they're still drawn by Adam. Um, and, you know, early on in development, the decision was made that the characters would be in 2D and the environments would be in 3D. So it looks like I don't have a better particle, which is strange because I thought there were some smoke particles in here, but I guess not. What is, what are these things that are called smoke? Oh, those are particles. They just look really weird in this version of Unity. Okay. To call this chamber smoke. And we'll model that inside of here. So I can do that sort of thing. Well, that's kind of neat. It's more of a, it's more of like a fiery sort of thing, which doesn't. I'd rather keep something that's white because then I can adjust the um, colors more easily. So that's, you know, it's not exactly, exactly right, but it's not bad. And we can have them just kind of staying in place. And probably not quite so high or so big. Probably also darker. Oh, let's see. Hmm. Let's see how it looks in a square. And sometimes it's hard to see in the tiny little screen thing at the bottom, so we can see. So that's how it's looking at the moment. Um, this is kind of getting lost in the fog, but that's not necessarily a problem. Um, you know, I think the general idea is getting across. There's a lot of solid mass back there right now, which there shouldn't be. There should be more wires hanging and more smoke. Um, so what I might do is put another smoke particles floating at the ceiling too. So let's make this not as high. General idea, um, maybe make it a lot darker. I'll have to if not make it darker. Maybe I should change it to multiply. Then make these bigger. Ooh, that's looking kind of creepy. Well, 
it will probably need some more dusting, but okay, general. That's right, you didn't see it. I also want to have this a little bit more random. All right, so let's see. This this uh, structure is getting a little bit lost, so what I'm going to do is add a light next to it. Let's see. Let's make sure I have it in the right place. That is another useful part of putting a halo on a light, just so you know you're putting it in the right place. And I don't want it to show up, so I can make it a little bit more intense. So it's lighting that up. Um, push it to the side a little bit. So that way now it's not really getting lost anymore. And, uh, oops. Hmm. That's not bad. Turn me up a little bit. Whatever. Well, now it's just getting kind of disappearing. So let's put it back the way it was. All right. For the moment, I think that is not bad. It might be a little too bright, so you can tone it down. But at least you can still see it, and it's not lost. Um, so, yeah, I can't roll it by that. Oh, wow, it's already after 3.30. Well then, let's work on getting a couple more cameras laid out. OK, so that was. The first one, and I'm gonna and I had stuck another camera in here that looks super bright green now. Let's see why. Oh, it looks like it's inside of this guy. So let's let's back it way up. See another. Let's let's go all the way to the other end of the chamber. Let's see how that looks. So we can kind of have a different perspective on how this room looks. All right, so you'll notice there's some, you can see some floating wires, you can see the background sky, um, but we can fix all of that. So let's copy this giant wall, move it to the other end, and oh, it looks like it is 
showing up on the side of pen is useful. Let's make sure that it didn't affect anything in the first camera. But nope, it didn't. All right. And everything is kind of cloaked in fog. Oops. I don't know if I just moved. All right. Let's go ahead and, oh, okay. Zoom into this view. So now we're gonna make a camera that's not for a specific card, or not based on specific card art, but it's, you know, inspired by the general setup um, that we put in here. So I can make a copy of that structure and I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller and move it over here and rotate it so we can see some glowing, some glowingness. So it's, you know, it kind of reflects the general idea um, from the other side, but it's not the exact same camera. And we'll add some more cables. So what I did is I copied that group of cables that I have on the other end of the chamber. Woo, and look at that. Everything is like cloaked in fog and I can't see what's going on. Which makes it really useful that you can just turn the fog right off. And that wasn't even a problem. I guess I, I must be behind the wall. Yep, I'm behind the wall. So the second group of cables, so I'll just move it down to the other end and there they are. Just kind of Being in there. Um, so I made a material for the cables. It's not exactly the greatest. It's shiny, which is kind of nice, but it it looks a little weird um, because these are not real high resolution cables. Um, I'm wondering if they might look better with a tune shader on them. Let's see. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. It's hard to tell. But. I think I'll. I like them better the way they were before. All right, so we got this kind of stuff happening down here. And since we don't know exactly what's, how this end of the chamber looks, we can kind of make it up. And let's see. What do we want to put on the floor here? Well, we probably want another, some more lights. So let's copy one of those and bring it to the other end. So we get the front with that underglow kind of happening. Um, it also could be cool. Let's see. Let's see if there's any other cables. It's like when I moved uh, <laughs> when I moved the um, moved stuff around. I lost, I lost it. There it is. So there's those cables, those cables, and those cables are the ones that are already made. But these these are kind of interesting because they're laying on the ground, and I could make them bright green. 
um, which might be kind of cool. So let's let's see what that looks like. That looks a little weird, but maybe it's because it's too big. Oops. Now that's kind of cool, that sort of thing. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if we want something like coming right at us in the camera, but maybe if it was like going across the floor, it's sort of a neat effect. We can have it disappear behind one of these things. It can disappear behind that. Um, you know. The concern is to make sure it doesn't look weird in the other camera that's, oops, in the other direction. That's also not a bad plan. It's very, very bright though. Um, that is one. It's very large and bright. But we can try it and uh, maybe add some some props on top of it. Let's see. Let's get some stuff. There's these weird pipes. We can stick some of those in if it makes sense. Um, what do these look like? Oh, here's here's the pipes we need for that other scene, for the other view. The well, I don't know about these particular ones. I might try to find a better better looking pipe. Um, I mean, obviously, I'll change the texture on it, but. Long skinny pipes are interesting. Um, let's look at some other kits. Oops. Oh, these are cool. You can stick one of these barrels in and put um, a green, green glow around it instead of blue. That's kind of neat. I don't know about right in the front there, but maybe over here to break up that that group. Oops. Put in the structures holder. Not much holder, but. And let's see what kind of materials are on here. I kind of like the materials that are on there. They're a little bit, um, other than the, the blue, they're a little bit different. Um, it looks like it is all one, one thing. Let's see, it looks like a tune shader. So that blue won't really match, but we can go ahead and modify the texture that is on it. Um, let's make it bigger. I think that might be a nice change of pace from the really dark gray. It has like a two-tone gray on it. Let's stick it back here. If I make it a little bit bigger. Let 
there are those cables that are overlapping it weirdly. So, you know, this came from one of our asset packs and it, it's kind of nice, um, but the blue should be green. So let's see, that looks like it's a TGA file. Let's see what happens. Oh, Photoshop opens it. So let's see what it looks like in Photoshop, if that's in a separate layer or what. And it's not, it's all together, but that is okay. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that in case I want to change it. Let's see. Well, let me select the blue and not quite. So I'm going to go ahead and then just draw green right over it. So let's see. Does the like clipboard still have that green color? Nope. Sure doesn't. So I want it to be the same green that I'm using on the low material and on the lights. And so now I have that and I get the right brush, the right size brush, I should say. Now it's a sponge. And it's kind of glowing, so maybe I do want the slightly bigger one with a little bit of fuzz. So let's just trace this and see if that works. You notice I'm making it a little bit thicker and covering up the um, yeah, since it's a new one, so sure. I'll save that. Some texture. And I will change the texture that's on here to the new one that I just made. So as you can see now the bottom has that green glow. Um which fits right into this environment. Um I think this lighter part might need to be slightly darker um, to match. So I'll make that a little bit darker also. Actually, I'll just do this. Wee! And it's gonna be black. Watch this. I will big black box over it and make it I'll put it fifty percent. Maybe maybe thirty. So it's not real dark but it's darker than it was. And I'll save it and just dinged in my ears but hopefully that didn't make a blasting ding noise on the stream. And so it's a little bit darker but it kind of works. And a new sip of water. All right. Oh, it looks like I covered up the chat. So um, if anyone was asking a question, I covered it up. But there, it's back now. Um, so Photoshop, I will I'll make a window. All right. So I'll go back to my layer of green glowingness. And I'll trace over. So yeah, the brown ones are gonna be a little trickier, but I can trace over the this part. Ah. 
did I just do? Oh, it looks like I accidentally deleted what I, what I, what I just did. I'll deselect instead of deleting. Switch it back to green. And draw in this crazy green logo. or trace it in over what's already there. The rest of this texture is, you know, not bad. Let's see how that's looking. That's looking and I guess the uh, those round pieces are on the top and bottom, so I'm not going to even worry about those yet. Um, I could do. I'm thinking. I don't think it'll let me select them. Oops, too far zoomed in. Oh, actually, maybe it will. That would be useful. I didn't think it was going to. Well, that was very useful. So I can make a new layer and I can just fill that in. In case you want to turn one of these on its side and show the green glow around the top of it. So I'll do the same thing over here. If it'll let me, which does not look like it's going to let me. It's on the wrong layer. All right. Cool. All right, so I have modified this. I've changed the um, blues to greens. So now this uh, barrel will be useful in the game. And I should probably, well, actually, here's what I'll do. So I have a prefabs folder that of like, it has this structure in it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this barrel now that it's modified and make it into a, its own new prefab. So in case I wanna use it again in another, another area, it's ready to go. So I don't know about having that there. Maybe I'll move that to the other side. off in the distance or right there or back over there all right so that's another camera and it looks like it is a almost four o'clock so we'll show you what the next step in this process would be um with the two cameras that i have so i'm going to save this scene and open up the demo scene and um, so the demo manager we would set up 
So it captured, right now it's it's set up to capture 2048 by 2048 captures, which are um, what we'd use in game, but I can set it up to be, you know, um, you know, 1920 by 1080 or a 4K resolution, you know, it depends what we're using it for. Um, so here's this crazy glowing room. And if I press the right button, it'll capture it. And then go to the other camera and see, now I'm seeing something that I missed before, which is this weird cloud of smoke that gets, gets like cut off here. And then these, you can still see those cables hanging as well as the weird reflection from those cables. So uh, I'm gonna do a few things. I'm gonna go back and fix that. So let's see, easy fix for this camera. If the particle system is to just add another one that is closer. So let's see. That's all the way at that end of the chamber. So let's move it over here. And let's see what that looks like bigger. Not bad. Um, the cables are floating, but I'm not going to worry about that at the moment. Let's see. Well, you know, for you know, day one of development on this environment, it is, you know. It's acceptable to have things like that happening. Let's turn these both back on. So it's not, you know, it's not quite perfect, but it's a decent start, I think. So I'll capture that. And let's see, those are in a folder somewhere on my computer where all of all those go so I didn't put in it should be under hand blabber but I didn't put that in so it's just going to default company the celestial tribunal and as you can see I don't know it's in this unity folder it's doing something um, so now I've got nice um, high quality captures of those two cameras which you know from this point I would I could look at them and say well there's this weird floating cable problem. I should fix that before I put it in the game or, um, you know, or I could say this one looks good. I'll put it in the game and then they'd be mixed up. Um, but Celestial Tribunal isn't in the UI yet. So I, uh, I'm not going to show that stuff on the stream, but, um, and it is after four o'clock now. So I guess I should wrap it up. Um, uh, keep covering up the chat. And um, all right, well, thank thank you everybody for joining me. I hope um, I hope this was interesting in some way. Um, I know I know I enjoy this, and um, I think it's interesting. But um, so yeah, so that is um, you know day one of development on the Celestial Tribunal, and um, thank you for joining me. And I will see you all again at the next uh, developer stream. And have a great day. And I am going to sign off.